What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It is Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar, and we have a special guest on today. We have Matthew Ho, and Matthew has been on the show, uh, I believe, twice before. And Matthew is a decorated captain in the Marine Corps, or was a decorated captain in the Marine Corps, and then worked in the State Department as part of the Provincial Reconstruction Team in Afghanistan. And then back in 2009, uh, Matt came out and blew the whistle on the Afghan surge, where there was this big uh, public relations campaign from the Pentagon to try to force Barack Obama into escalating the war. And and, uh, Matthew Ho heroically came out and said, this is going to be a terrible idea. And uh, Matthew, I believe you resigned, right? I did. I did, yeah. So, Matt, welcome to the show. And I just want to let you know, and I speak for Danny as well, we both just hold you in the absolute you know, greatest esteem. Um, we, we really appreciate all the work that, you're, that you do. Um, I'm, I'm always interested in hearing your insight on things, and we, we, we're, we're really appreciative of that, that you're joining us today. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you all saying that. And thank you for having me back on, and thanks to everyone for listening. So, you know, what we want to talk about today, and, and I really just wanted your insight. Obviously, right now, the, it is, the date is November 1st. It's about 7.44 p.m. And the reason why I'm timestamping this is just because there's so many things happening on the ground. <laughs> what, we yeah. say, what we say within the next two days can, ble- can be completely different. The next two but hours, think, it'll be completely different. <laughs> yeah. From what I've seen last... I believe the civilian death count. So this is according to the, uh, I guess, the Gaza uh, health ministry or whatever health ministry. Of health. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's around 8,500 deaths, the majority of them being civilians. And I think there's around 3,000 deaths. And you know, I had said a couple. I think last time we spoke that um, morbidly, there always seems to be a death count around these these um, these uh, offensives or these these conflicts between Israel and Gaza or the IDF in Gaza, and that death count right now is much higher than anything that we've seen since, I think, really for since you know our, our adult lifetime. Um, yeah. I think combined, it is the death count is higher than pretty much all the incursions from 2006 combined at this mm-hmm. point. And from everything that I'm reading is just that this thing is going to get a whole lot worse, that, you know, there's going to be, there's really a humanitarian crisis brewing. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's only going to get bloodier and it's just in complete tragedy. So Matt, I, what I really wanted to ask you and, and Danny and I discussed this question to lead this off. So let's just say the Israeli government gives you a call and says, all right, we want to figure things out right, right now. Uh, we're going to call Matt Ho up. What would be <laughs> your first recommendation for them? I, I think, uh, well, first off, of course, uh, I'm more likely to get a call from, you know, Scarlett Johansson or someone asking me out uh, than getting a call <laughs> from the Israeli government asking me out opinion. And so, but if Netanyahu uh, was to call me and say, what should I do? I think I'd reply as, I can't remember if it was Zinn or if Chomsky, when he was asked a similar question, uh, you know, about the U.S. president, he said he, he resigned, you know, <laughs> resigned is what you should do. But, yeah. um, you know, it is. It, 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 I, I'm glad you brought up the thing about the timestamp because uh, what we say, uh, things occur so quickly and we're so connected. Uh, and what we're seeing happen uh, in real time. I mean, in real time, uh, God bless Al Jazeera because their folks are on the ground. And if you watch Al Jazeera English, which I encourage people to do, and I encourage people to watch a variety of sources, but Al Jazeera English certainly has, uh, one, they're very professional, but also, two, that they have the resources in Gaza to be reporting on what's occurring as it's occurring. And it's quite striking, and obviously it's very emotional, too. But what's what we're witnessing... You know, this ever advancing form of warfare that's uh, reinforced by uh, the emotion that the technology allows us to present. Right. So because of the technology we have, we are able to witness these events as they occur and we can have a very real connection to it. And I think that would inform what I would say to Netanyahu in the sense of you are dealing with something here in terms of opening up uh, 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 an uncontrollable force that is only going to be served by the emotions of tens and tens, hundreds of millions of people around the world who are witnessing this. 
So whereas war has always been an uncontrollable force, something that cannot be managed, something that uh, at best is, uh, you know, I shouldn't say it that way, but something that can't be managed, it's always going to have unintended consequences, right? It's always going to make humans be its servant rather than war being, you know, the servant of humans. All those types of tropes about war, things we've known about it, you know, and you'd see it in, in the Romans and how they have dealt with war and how they constructed uh, their religion and their, their, their culture and their society under, with that understanding of what war actually was like uh, as an uncontrollable force, right? Um, you know, and so I think looking at that and seeing then this ability for us to be present there as it occurs and the, knowing that what that does for our emotions and how that can influence things, that's going to make this conflict uh, not just more uh, not just more unpredictable, uh, not just come with uh, greater unintended consequences, but also much more powerful because the emotions that can drive this conflict further into places where we can't imagine where it would go. We have some ideas. We, you know, I mean, with the timestamp you're saying, as we're doing this on November 1st, well, on November 3rd, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the leader of Hezbollah in Lebanon, is set to make a major announcement. And I, I have a feeling he's not going to be saying, hey, let's, we're going to beat our swords into plowshares, right? I mean, so two days from now, this could be an entirely different set of circumstances and a reality uh, that we're just not dealing with now. So I, I think that's what I would, would try and caution them with. But then also, too, falling back on the regular, the, 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 the more understandable or normative aspect of this where Hamas, and you brought up Afghanistan when you're introducing me, and, and the Taliban were similar. They weren't the problem. They were a symptom of the problem. What's the problem? Foreign occupation that led to civil war that created these groups. You know, you have that here in uh, in, in Palestine as well, you have uh, uh, Hamas, uh, but they're not the problem. They are a symptom of the problem. Unless you address that underlying problem, unless you go to the root causes of it and address uh, the, the uh, grievances of the Palestinian people, which are legitimate grievances against occupation, grievances against oppression, grievances against humiliation, you will always have symptoms like Hamas. And the thing about it is as time goes on, as the occupation uh, continues, as oppression worsens, worsens, as the Palestinians get more desperate, who do they turn to? They turn to someone, you know, they turn to whoever's available. And often that is the most extreme. And as these things progress, if you look back, these groups become more and more extreme. So say Israel is, is capable of eliminating Hamas, which is, of course, uh, nonsense because, you know, again, it's, they're an idea. Uh, Hamas stands for the Islamic Revolutionary Movement, right? The, I'm sorry, Islamic Resistance Movement, uh, right? So this idea of resistance, you're going to just annihilate that? You're going to eradicate that? How are you going to do that? But say you are able to get rid of all the membership cadre and leadership of Hamas. Uh, well, that idea is still going to be present. The resistance is still going to be there. And undoubtedly, as we've seen, as history shows us, uh, including modern history, what comes next will be worse. Right? So, so, right? I mean, so, yeah. So, you know, something you say about, like, eliminating Hamas and, you know, there's, like, been a couple of plans that have been speculated. I guess we really don't know. The Israelis haven't given us what their plan is. We have a pretty vague plan. It's like, hey, we're going to eliminate Hamas, and then you know, that's it. That's all we're really hearing. Um, well, we have seen we have seen uh, leaked documents that have been reported by the Israeli press, uh, particularly one from October thirteenth from the uh, Israeli uh, Ministry of Intelligence. And the Israeli Ministry of Intelligence is not uh, the, it's not where the Shin Bet and the Mossad and the Unit 8200 guys hang out, right? It's not where the spies. The Ministry of Intelligence in, in Israel is an organization that's devoted to planning, basically. That that's their job, and they produced a document that has been verified as as uh, as one of their documents, uh, basically describing an ethnic cleansing process in Gaza. And we've seen Israel more or less carrying that out, right? This idea of pushing Gazans from the north to the south, eventually make it so uninhabitable that they have to leave, uh, then putting pressure through the U.S. on other nations, especially Egypt, to take these people in. And what we've seen even with the, the, this uh, budget supplement 
this emergency spending supplement by the, by the White House. It includes about $10 billion total for humanitarian assistance. And a lot of that money uh, is available to be used for uh, settling uh, refugees. So the idea would be that once you push them out of Gaza, you then build a giant wall and they never come back in. Right. And this is one of the reasons why Arab nations do not want to accept Palestinian refugees, because they know they will never be allowed to return. They don't want to take part in the ethnic cleansing. Right. As well as they don't want no nation wants that many refugees coming in, no matter how good hearted you are, there's going to be problems. And then say for Egypt, they especially don't want Hamas to come in because Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood that the dictator Sisi has, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ha, you know, it ha, has a, a, a irreconcilable differences with, right? To put it, to put it simply. But um, uh, you know, I mean, so you see all this, and this looks like the plan that they may be carrying out. But you know, certainly there are other options. But those options certainly do not allow for the uh, finalization uh, or the conclusion of the Gaza problem. And we have seen over and over again for decades, uh, Israelis speak of a uh, conclusive ending to the problem in Gaza, including people, not not people just mouthing off on Twitter, but serious people, people who are cabinet ministers now uh, have said these types of things. Have uh, uh, Bezalel Smotrich, who is the finance minister, um, you know, years ago, he said, we need to go into Gaza and give the Gazans three options. They pledge allegiance to us. They immigrate, immigrate, meaning they are exiled, uh, or they're killed, right? And this is the finance minister now, and there are plenty of others throughout the Israeli government who see that way. So is this, the, this their opportunity to pursue this conclusion to the Gaza problem? Uh, otherwise, what are the options? I mean, the options are to go in there, try and eliminate Hamas, and then what, garrison Gaza? with a, a reinforced infantry division, have five, six, 10, 12 of your soldiers killed every week in IED attacks. I already tried that, that humiliation. <laughs> yeah. And then there's other, you've, we've seen stuff being floated in the last couple of days about uh, a United Nations mission going in there, about protective forces going in there, other ideas about how do they, you know, what will be, what comes next after you go in and you kill all these people and you occupy it, what then? Uh, and, you know, and obviously the, the thing that's not getting uh, not getting addressed, not getting uh, passed around in, in conversation is the idea of a political settlement and a guy idea in a negotiation that would address the grievances of the Palestinian people and, and produce some form of outcome that would ensure equal human political and civil rights for all people, uh, Israelis uh, and Palestinians. There, well, what so I'm many- hearing. Oh, go ahead, Danny. I was just going to say, Matt, you, you bring up so many fascinating topics and we can take this in so many different directions. So I'm going to I'm gonna try to choose one because I, I know Henry's probably itching to ask his own questions too. Um, all right. You said that uh, there's a concerted effort to, to potentially pressure uh, a party like Egypt into you know accepting uh, uh, a deluge of refugees from the Gaza Strip, such that you know it could be thoroughly ethnically cleansed, put up a big wall, you know, no more right of return, you know, uh, you lose your UN, you know, uh, uh, rights because it's now depopulated. Um, but you also rightly pointed out that that's kind of a problem for Egypt. They've already basically said no, right? Uh, it sounds like. And I've read a few reports of, of them mobilizing some some troops to make sure that uh, uh, people don't get across the border, uh, which is scary, right? Um, but we shouldn't expect otherwise. This yeah. idea that when, when people talk about the Arab nations, why do we expect Sisi? Why do we expect mm-hmm. MBS? Why do we expect Bashar Assad? You know, why do we, you know, even even uh, uh, King Hussein, uh, mm-hmm. you're right. I mean, why do we accept, why do we expect them to do the right thing here. And well, because we're, because the Palestinians are real people and they're all just quote unquote Arabs anyway. So why don't they just live that's, with the Arabs? That's, that's exactly. the Israeli like, yep. line and, and yeah. I'm not going to tout that. But, well, you know, the line I'm hearing is right. that, well, the, the Palestinians are so bad that, that nobody wants not them. even <laughs> Egypt will take them. Yeah. Not even yeah, Jordan that's, will that's take crazy. them. Because uh, they're a special type of bad. So here, here's the historical question that I have for you. So way back when, you know, in the wars that you were, you know, involved in, uh, unfortunately, we pressured Egypt into like basically supporting our our you know efforts in in Afghanistan and Iraq by paying off their IMF you know uh, uh, debts, 
And it sounds like that's being floated again. Do you think that, um, and, and Egypt right now is terribly like poor, right? Like probably second only to, uh, I don't know, Ukraine right now, like, like a desperate right. financial situation, right? Yeah. yeah ma- massive, massive debt crisis they're right. having right now. I forget how much, 160 billion or something. something. Like I forget that, what it right? is. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I, I, I read some unconfirmed reports, but I mean, even if it's unconfirmed, like the option, if you can think of the option, it's probably an option, right? The idea that, that they help make the IMF ease up on some of those loans that they have to take out because that's the only way that they can keep their economy running right now. Do you think that's enough of a hmm, carrot uh, that someone like CC would bite, uh, despite the fact that, you know, uh, the, the, the Hamas is, you know, an offshoot, as you said, of, of the Muslim Brotherhood to which he is somewhat diametrically opposed? Do you think that's enough I mean, it certainly is a big deal. I mean, to to have that type of relief from the IMF. Uh, look, let's go back a month or so before uh, October seventh, uh, when those you know horrific attacks occurred. You know, and um, uh, and the big story was that Ryan Grimm at the Intercept and 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 uh, uh, what's his name, Mataza Hussein, I think as well, uh, were writing about what happened with Pakistan and how the U.S had in exchange for the Pakistanis providing weapons to Ukraine, had gotten the IMF to provide uh, some loans that the Pakistanis desperately needed. Um, So this type of of utilization of the IMF for these purposes is not just historic, it's also recent. And for the purposes of getting countries to change there and also to remember the story we, we we were learning in the last couple of months about the U.S. that the, the the possible involvement in the U.S. of the U.S. in the removal of, of Imran Khan as Pakistan's prime minister, right? And then after that occurs, the complete shift, you know, uh, uh, in Pakistan while Khan, while Khan while Imran Khan is prime minister is criticized by the U.S. for being, as they called it, uh, aggressively neutral towards the war in Ukraine. And then when he's removed, you have this change of attitude towards it and then weapons and an IMF loan and et cetera. So this is this is how they operate. Right. And is it enough, though, is a good question with everything we said about this idea of of, of bringing in a population, what that does to a receiving country, just in practical terms. We're not talking good, uh, you know, uh, moral, uh, you know, anything like that. Just in terms of of, of what kind of weight that carries, uh, the the real the real consequences of that in terms of a population uh, increase. Uh, but and, and the promises are is that the Palestinians would then be settled into other nations, Canada chief among them. But that the Pal- these these two point three million Palestinians, these Gazans, would then go on to other countries as well. That's kind of what the storyline is. Um, you know, there there is a, 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 a deal uh, that the Israelis, the U.S., the Egyptians, and the Palestinian Authority were involved in about 15 years or so ago. Uh, and it, it, it went on for a couple of years, as far as I can recall, that this idea that the Palestinians, the Gazans were going to leave uh, Gaza, as well as, if I remember correctly, a good portion of, of Palestinians from the West Bank and East and East East Jerusalem as well, and that they were going to settle in this cutout section of the Sinai, and that Mahmoud Abbas, the the head of the Palestinian Authority, the head of Fatah, uh, would uh, have ownership of this state, and this would be the Palestinian state, and they would have a seaport, and they have an airport, and they would have their own country in the middle of the Sinai. Uh, you know, and that's something that never went anywhere. But that's the type of thinking that is out there. Uh, and certainly, again, if you look at uh, the pressure that the U.S. is putting on Egypt, on other countries, uh, you know, I don't think when, when and Blinken was was Secretary of State Blinken was very poorly received when he tried to speak with these leaders and he got a dressing down from Sisi, probably because he went forward or maybe possibly I shouldn't say probably maybe he went forward with these types of ideas. You know, expecting. And so it comes back to why would the Egyptians, what do they get out of this? And so participating in the ethnic cleansing, taking on this population uh, and then the political consequences from uh, internal internally to Egypt from the Egyptians who would say, how could you betray these people? How could you do this? Uh, is that I mean, that in itself is a huge, huge risk for Sisi, as well as for the other uh, Arab leaders. 
so yeah, I mean that's a really good question. Is that enough? Uh, I, I I tend not to think. I, I don't think. So. I don't think it is. But uh, you know, if in six years, 12, 12 months, or six months, six months, twelve months from now, uh, things are there's less attention to it. Could something like that then possibly? Uh, be dealt? Could a deal like that be struck? You know, I, I think so. In this moment, I don't think so. But maybe Are you six suggesting now? that 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 uh, perhaps it'll take six to twelve months for two point three million Gazans to live in half of a besieged, you know, strip? Or well, it took uh, <laughs> it, it took the Iraqi army nine months to take Mosul. Okay. Um, and you know, certainly if you looked at the uh, fighting that occurred uh, throughout Syria. Uh, you know, the, the sieges on Aleppo, uh, the fighting in Raqqa, Raqqa, I mean, gives you, I think, an idea of how long these, the, these could take. You know, our, our, our second battle of Fallujah in Iraq, that took a month, more or less, uh, you know, and, um, you know, so it, it could be that length. It could be six months. It could be 12 months. Uh, really don't know. Um, really don't know. And we also really don't know what the Israeli course of action is going to be. Um, you know, the way they're demolishing these homes, the, these buildings, these these schools, these, you know, uh, warehouses, garages, you know, just flattening them. Well, there, there's a reason behind it besides the punishment reason, which certainly is key. You know, this idea of they're going to punish, and this is, this is Israeli doctrine, really, that the response is going to be so overwrought, so heavy, that, you know, it's going to give pause to anyone to do something in the future. I mean, this is what occupiers do, right? When they're trying to subjugate someone, make it so terrible, make the, the, the punishment that you're inflicting so bad that no one will ever try and do something again because you're going to harm the innocents. I mean, I think people, people are most familiar with this idea with, say, the, the, the occupying army of Germany and France, where if uh, the French resistance blew up a train or killed a German officer, then the German army uh, executed 25 innocent French people, right, or whatever, however that worked. The idea of making, making it such a horror, making it terror of itself, that they would not, there, there'd be uh, uh, such pressure among the population against the resistance because they didn't want to pay any longer for what the actions of the resistance. So, but I mean, so that's, that goes into the bombing, but also the bombing by flattening entire neighborhoods. I think, I think this is what people are saying. The idea is that you're closing off the tunnels, right? So you're closing off the entrances and the exits to the tunnels. And so if, is that the idea? Is it, is it just that get to the point where you have reduced all of say Northern Gaza to rubble? that these tunnels are sealed because we dropped every building on top of them and these people in the tunnels can't get in, I mean, can't get out, and they're just going to suffocate and die in there. Is that what the Israelis plan to do? Or do they plan to go into the tunnels? Do they plan to push? Right now, we really haven't seen their infantry move in to built up areas. Are they planning even to do that? Or are they always going to stay on the perimeter and just try and control the situation by fire, basically, with tanks and machine guns, artillery, aircraft and drones, and, and just and, and conduct their occupation that way. And, you know, do a, a siege in a medieval sense where we're just going to starve these people out. They can sit in their tunnels and that's where they'll die. Eventually, they will run out of food. They will run out of water. They will suffocate. Uh, is that the approach they're going to take? You know, so we got a, we have a lot to try and we have a lot to try and speculate on here on what they're going to do, um, and you know, unlike say the Ukrainians who are very loose lipped in terms of their operational plans, the Israelis are, are much tighter lipped. Uh, so we, we're not really too sure what what we're going to see them do. The only thing we can be sure of, the only certainty we can be sure of, is that the atrocities we're seeing right now, that this this uh, organized murder that we're witnessing uh, isn't stopping any, anytime soon, and it may get worse. So, I mean, after this this bombing campaign, so let's just say six months down the line, they, they reduce, like, you know, they destroy 50% of the buildings in Gaza. How long does it take for a city like that to be livable? Like, aren't there long-term health effects for even living in that air in terms of just all the debris and, you know, burnt, elect you know, electrical cords and furniture and all that crap? You know, like people are still having health problems from from nine eleven. Um, I mean, how? I mean, will Gaza, or you know, especially Gaza City, will it be even livable in two years, three years? 
if you want to push people into the Sinai, yeah, make it so that it's a death trap uh, and unlivable, uh, right? So that there is no place to go, that there is no place uh, to sleep. There is no place to, to, to uh, live, let alone have commerce and education and all the things that any society needs. But your point about the health aspects is very real. I mean, just the, the no water, no, no water, no sanitation, uh, the, the risk of disease. You have, of, we have no idea how many thousands of bodies are buried in the rubble. Uh, the risks that come from that. Uh, we're starting to hear reports, particularly of children uh, dealing with uh, 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 health issues, disease issues relating from drinking dirty water because wow. in many, right, that, so we're starting to hear these stories. And that was, that was the fear that predates this, that, you know, one of the fears about Gaza was that it would at some point endure some type of, of, of epidemic, it would endure some type of outbreak, uh, cholera or whatnot. You know, I mean, because that was always a danger of having, uh, you know, a blockaded city under siege is like something like that could spread very easily, uh, particularly when it's, uh, you know, uh, the most one of the if not the most one of the most dense places in the world. Uh, so the idea of this being a livable uh, place, if, say, half the buildings are destroyed and uh, the, the Israelis certainly are reaching for that number, they've conducted as of a day or two ago, they had conducted 11,000 strikes on targets. So that means 11,000 different buildings were hit or have been hit. You know, some maybe multiple times, but, you know, you get that idea of, of how massive this aerial campaign is. Uh, and then what comes from that? And yeah, all the health issues. And then with the in terms of, of not just the, the water and the sewer lines, uh, but you also have other issues that this is a modern city. So there's all kinds of chemicals, there's all kinds of batteries, there's all kinds of right hazardous materials that are also being spread out, leaching into the ground. So you have this idea of even if you do clear the rubble, you have a toxified landscape, you have a polluted environment that may in itself, because of all that destruction, not be livable. You know, and certainly we've seen these toxic legacies of war in Vietnam, all throughout Southeast Asia, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. We're going to see that in, a, in an unimaginable way in Ukraine. My God, what, what those people are going to live through for generations uh, if and when that thing, if that, when that horrible war ever ends. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this idea that what choice will the Palestinians in Gaza have but to leave? Uh, but I mean, in, immediately what we're looking right now, though, is we're looking as if the, the Israelis are entering a phase of the operation where they have uh, a, 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 a plan of action that resembles uh, kill anything that moves. Uh, and they've done all the work up front to cover themselves, to say we gave them warning, we told them to leave. That's all specious. It's also unlawful in international law, but it's incredibly uh, specious. Uh, no place for them to go. There's no safe for those people. No safe place for those people to evacuate to. They were bombing in the south as well. So where were they going to go? But you know what we've seen uh, and may see is a is a, a kill anything that moves type of of uh, of, of plan of of, of, of or, or, or conduct of their forces there. And what's crazy, you know, like I've been reading stuff that's comparing, you know, Gaza with with Mosul and. One of the highlights was, and what's like unprecedented, what is Israelis' policy on bombing hospitals, where they're just saying, "Hey, you have two days to evacuate this hospital, and this is a functional hospital with hundreds of people who are in critical condition." Um, you know, I was reading that in Mosul, at the very least, the Iraqi army would wait until you know ISIS would have you know, military operations or, or create bases and headquarters in hospitals, but they would wait until that hospital was, you know, more or less um, considered non-functional to, to take it down. In this case, like, it's, it just seems like so unprecedented. Now, I'm not saying anything about, you know, I know there's kind of like, um, it's the, the, the original hospital bombing that happened about a week or two ago. I know that's like still up in the air and the evidence isn't completely out on that one. But I'm just saying like they're literally giving them warnings like, hey, you need to evacuate in what, two days, three days? Like is that's not, does that, is that even feasible? 
No, it's not. I mean, where are they, they going to go? How do you evacuate babies that are in the NICU? How do you evacuate people that are hooked up to respirators? I mean, where are they going to go? How can they go anywhere? We've seen, um, uh, and we've seen this from the Israelis in other air bombing campaigns. So this is the fifth major uh, aerial assault on Gaza since 2008. Um, and uh, there's also been minor ones, right? Um, you know, so... Uh, you know, the Israelis have hit hospitals before. They have hit schools before. They have hit U.M. facilities before. Uh, it's well documented. There's no argument. Uh, and I think the Israelis just take the attitude of we're going to do it. We're going to claim uh, with or without evidence uh, that Hamas has fighters there or there's command and control facilities there or the tunnels run underneath them. And it's true. The tunnels do run underneath them. So the Israelis can claim that they're, you know, that they're striking Hamas anywhere because there's supposedly 300 miles of tunnels running throughout Gaza. So, you know, but that, of course, is a violation of international law. Uh, we can get into all that, the specifics of it. But any of the Israeli arguments that they are engaging in good faith or that they're engaging within the limits of the law of, of the uh, law of war is, is completely not. It's just not true. Uh, you know, what they're doing is, 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 is are, are war crimes. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, this idea that uh, that they have shown any type of restraint, uh, and that's the line going around, you know, those who are supporting and apologizing for Joe Biden in this administration, is that he has leaned into the ear of Benjamin Netanyahu, and the Israelis are showing restraint because of that. And so, my God, if this is what restraint, this is what, it looks like with restraint what it will look like without restraint um and they have dropped thousands upon thousands of bombs i mean just unknown amount of artillery shells and now with their ground forces moving in um you know i mean the the, the, the again we're i think we're in the opening phases of of, of this atrocity so, I mean, we were talking about this refugee camp that was bombed and apparently it was a bomb to get a single Hamas leader or Hamas colonel. I mean, is that normal? Is like to to bomb a refugee camp? Just no, to get it, one it's guy? against it's it's against international law. It's against all the conventions of, of that and treaties that we as modern nations have signed into. So whether it's United Nations, uh, the, the, whether it's the Fourth Geneva Convention, whether it's uh, uh, the Rome Statutes or the International Criminal Court. Uh, this is all against those those treaties. This is, these are war crimes. Is uh, Israel a party cannot, to those? If, if, what's <laughs> the, that? Is Israel a party to those? Because you know, one of the uh, they're not always uh, signed on to a lot of these international. Right. Agreements. So they're not they're not signed on to the International Criminal Court, but they are a member of the United Nations, and uh, and they have, I, and I believe they are. I, I be there. They are signatories to the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, so the. Um, but the idea, though, that you're going to bomb this refugee camp because there's supposedly a Hamas leader underneath. Um, well, you know, the, 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 when there's a mixed military civilian uh, uh, population, you have to protect the civilian population. If civilian population always outweighs, in international law, the civilian population always outweighs the military population. You also have to use, a, there's aspects of proportionality. You have to be discerning. I mean, all these different standards. The Israelis simply don't care about that. And they've said so. They've acted this way. They've acted this way before. So it's kind of the fact that we're going on about this, why I'm, I'm, that I'm going on about this is, is, I think, a little, it might be a waste of time because it doesn't matter. And certainly the United States is not going to say, hey, look, you are doing this. And we had our opportunity to do that. And we have said over and over and over again, despite what uh, you know, the White House or the State Department says about respecting human life, you know, the, the reality is, and this was just reiterated re the other day, uh, the White House spokesperson, Karine Jean-Pierre, uh, said, uh, you know, when asked about the weapons being given, if there be any conditions or limitations on the weapons we are giving to Israel, her response, as it has been from every American official, is that there is no, no limit, no conditions on any of the weapons that we give Israel. They can do whatever they want with them. So, you know, but to go after someone to, to bomb, a, to bomb a, a civilian target like that, knowing, uh, you know, again, densely populated place on Earth, the Jabala refugee camp, one of the most densely populated portions of Gaza. Right. I mean, so knowing the amount of people that were there uh, and then doing it twice 
uh, doing a follow-up bombing, particularly as you would have had, uh, you know, first responders, people who were trying to dig people out of the rubble. I think it's important for people to know that, you know, the machines in Gaza have stopped working. They've run out of fuel for their front end loaders and for all their, all their equipment. So everything has to be done by hand. And so to, to you see that type of attack, the viciousness of it, and you come back to the idea that this is punishment. This is a punitive expedition, just like, just like the Romans would have done. Right. This is a punitive expedition. This is like, you know, go go uh, uh, pop culture. This is like the, the Death Star, uh, the, the Empire blowing up Alderaan. Right. right. To prove a point. Right. To, 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 we are the Empire. You cannot disobey us. This is the consequences. Making a point for, you know, those in East Jerusalem as well as in, in the West Bank. And then, of course, playing to a domestic political audience and, of course, playing into uh, the the. the plans of those who have this idea of a greater Israel who want to see the, uh, you know, the expansion of the Zionist project, et cetera, et cetera. So Matt, I got a question and, and hopefully you could help me, you know, with your military background here. But one thing that, that gets me a little bit frustrated um, with this for a multitude of reasons is the idea that, that Hamas is using human shields. And I'll, I'll, readily, I'll readily admit that they are. Uh, that's that point is abundantly obvious, but I think looking at it from a more nuanced perspective, like how else do you not have quote unquote human shields in in an area like Gaza? So again, we're talking about a, a strip of land five to seven miles wide, depending on where, and twenty five miles long. And I'm just looking at a map, and I couldn't find any any like you know, land area, uh, uh, like exact land area perspectives. But there's not a ton of not densely populated city in this area, right? So like there are some fields, and there are some like uh, farm areas and things like that. But like from a strategic standpoint, right? You are the military, you know, uh, wing of Hamas or any you know Palestinian you know uh, uh, fighting force that's that's controlling this area. Do you put your weapons in out in the middle of the field where you know Israel can strike them, or do you put them somewhere where you can conceal them? And then the question becomes: Is anywhere you can conceal them far away from any number of people? And I think the answer is always going to be no, right? Right. And then you know, there's practical reasons too. You build your tunnels where there's infrastructure, where you're right, where your 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 bases, your tunnel. Uh, your forces can be supported by what infrastructure is available. Um, and then there might be reasons why. Look, maybe the reasons why those, those areas you see don't have buildings on them is because the ground cannot support buildings. So it's very possible if the ground cannot, cannot support buildings, it can't support tunnels as well. Right. I mean, so there may be reasons like that. Uh, but the idea is, though, is that they do have tunnels all throughout the civilian areas. And so but if ipso facto, right, the, that makes the people human shields. Uh, it, it's but it's not nearly as obscene. I mean, first of all, the whole thing is obscene. The war is obscene. But these particular arguments don't hold much weight, I think, because one, it relies on a trope that, well, these are brown people. These are Muslims. These are Arabs. They don't care about their people. They don't care if kids are killed. And any, any of us who've been watching all these videos that have come from Gaza, you know, I don't see any, any of the Gazan mothers and fathers just shrugging and walking away because life is cheap and they've got 12 kids and one's dead now. And so, oh, well. Yeah, I don't see that happening. I mean, these, these, so you have that racist trope about how they don't value life, uh, which, you know, is all throughout the propaganda. But in, in the other, other, another aspect is the, it, you can have human shields. The Israelis don't care. Do we have any evidence of the Israelis saying we're not going to bomb this because there are human shields there? They still bomb it. And they, if it was not for the attention of the international community and the world, they would bomb the hospitals. They bomb the hospitals anyway. They've hit the hospitals. Uh, when, when the uh, Al-Ali uh, Baptist Hospital was hit by that rocket, missile, bomb, whatever it was that occurred uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, at that point, according to the World Health, world Health Organization, uh, the Israelis had struck like 130 healthcare facilities between hospitals, clinics, storage facilities, ambulances. They simply do it anyway. So the idea that they're going to shield themselves with human with 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 human beings, uh, the Israelis. So the Israelis are, are carrying out the this. Situation, they're, right? Yeah, they're carrying out this bombing campaign, knowing full well they're killing the hostages. They simply don't care. 
that that's how they fight that that's their attitude towards this this goes back decades there's a great book by i think it was avi schleim uh, wrote this book called the iron wall and if people want to understand how many in israel have viewed their place in that part of the world and what they have to do to ensure it read that book the iron wall it's about the establishment of israel uh you know but it goes into a lot of detail what happens in the 50s but this idea of we are going to be an iron wall for which you know can't be defeated you know, and that includes this type of punitive punishment, this collective punishment against those who are going to dare to stand up against us. Uh, you know, so the idea of human shield, yeah, it's certainly there because they built the tunnels underneath the people. So by definition or by just the fact of that, they are. But it, I don't believe Hamas has that as like if they have their list of like, here's our strategy. I don't think that's up there. Right, because they know the Israelis just simply don't care. You also hear these reports from, um, you know, all these different organizations, uh, whether it's uh, the United Nations, Doctors Without Borders, Save the Children, all the different international entities. You know, as people are learning, like we, we learn about these communities, unfortunately, through war. So you hear about the Turkish hospital, you hear about the Indonesian hospital, you're watching television, you're seeing these interviews with like, these Norwegian doctors, right? I mean, so you're seeing the amount of international involvement. And these are all people who are humanitarians and who abide by all the international conventions. And you've never, I've never seen them, any of them say, yes, Hamas is operating out of our hospital. Because they would say that. They would leave. They would stop doing it. This is how those organizations work. They take that very seriously. And we've not seen that evidence. So is it possible in the case of the refugee camp that that Hamas commander was underneath the refugee camp? Absolutely. Totally. Does that in any way excuse, absolve, or, or make, or, 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 or uh, uh, make legal uh, what the Israelis did and morally, uh, you know, as well then too, what does that do? We get back to this initial thing. As you're doing this punishment, unless you eradicate them, unless you exterminate them, unless you, you know, cleanse them, you are just going to have to deal with this over and over and over again. You know, I, when I was in Afghanistan, I, I met this sergeant this, he, and he had been, he was probably on, he, I mean, he had multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan at that point. And he said something to me along the lines, you know, we, we just got to start shooting at 12 year olds. And, and it wasn't because, you know, he was a child murderer, you know, it wasn't because he was sick in the head or anything like that. It, what he was saying was tongue in cheek. Uh, and it was the idea that, look, as long as we're here, we're gonna be fighting them. You know, so these 12 year old kids, when we come back in five years, they're gonna be carrying Kalashnikovs, they're gonna be putting IEDs in the road. The, I mean, like this is this is just pointless. This is, you know, what we are facing here is just we are just doing the same thing over and over again. And that's what the Israelis have. And I think this is why these arguments about they're conducting ethnic cleansing hold so much water, because what else are they going to do? Right. What else are they going to do? Of course, they can uh, negotiate. They can have a political settlement. I mean, all those options. But in terms of if they want a military victory, then they have to remove the problem. Well, I mean, I'd like to talk about that problem a little bit more because, you know, one of the things that I that I'm still having a lot of trouble with is just my resolute anger against Hamas for deciding to do this because while I I feel for the plight of the Palestinians here and while I understand from a nuanced perspective how desperate these people are, they basically signed the death warrants of however many people are going to die. And if you are, it's one thing to be resolute to die for a cause yourself. It's another thing entirely to say, you're going to die for my cause. Right? Right. And this is, we were talking earlier about uh, how as these wars progress with time, uh, they become more and more extreme. Right. I was just reading something earlier that was criticizing the Palestinians in the in the 40s for being so weak need, if you will, for not having the collective will to organize and really fight back against uh, the Israelis. Um, you know, and as you see over time, the Palestinian resistance grow. And as hope is diminish, the oppression increases, the humiliation increases. Again, the reaction is more extreme. Extreme. The desperation grows. So you turn to more extreme groups. We saw this in Iraq with the, with the Sunnis, where who who could the Sunnis turn to? Their only options were 
uh, Al Qaeda, you know, which is what Saudi Arabia was providing them. Their only option was the Saudis and the Yemenis. And who did they provide? Al Qaeda. Right. I mean, and then once, you know, in Iraq, 2006, 2007, once we engaged with the Sunnis and gave them other options, they gave up Al Qaeda in a heart so quick. I mean, I was there for that. I saw that, you know, as we engaged with the Sunnis uh, and gave them their land back, gave them back control of their towns and cities, removed the Shia and Kurdish forces from their areas and gave uh, them control of their own people back and brought them back in the government. They just pointed out, yeah, the Al Qaeda guys, they're over in that house right over there. I mean, they gave them up like that because they no longer needed them, right? I mean, and so you, you see this in terms of of uh, why why would you have a leadership like in Hamas that makes a decision like this? I agree. The Palestinians have an absolute right, both under international law and natural law, to resist occupation. But why would you choose to do this? You know, and there's all kinds of, hey, this has thrown a huge monkey wrench into the, the normalization of relations between Israel and the Arab states and on and on. I, I, I get all that. But as you were saying, man, this what you knew was going to befall your people, you know, what you knew was going to come from this. Why would you choose to do this? Why would you choose to, to fight this way? And, uh, you know, I mean, maybe they want to suck uh, Israel into a bloody urban battle that humiliate them. Look, the, the, the Hamas planned for a year, maybe two years and prepared for those attacks on October 7th uh, in terms of the defense of Gaza and their preparations for that. That goes back two decades now. They've been preparing a defense and death and training their forces and stockpiling and everything else. So maybe they think they can suck Israel into a bloody and humiliating battle. And you also remember, again, these guys are extreme. So maybe their thoughts are that we do this, Israel comes in, and Hezbollah then comes in the war. And I know they're excited seeing what Erdogan in Turkey has been saying. I mean, Erdogan's speech over the last couple of, a couple of days ago when he spoke to what about a million people. Uh, you know, in front of them, uh, that was a call to arms. That was a call to arms. I mean, and the Houthis, so didn't the Houthis just recently that, 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 declare war on, on Israel or are they just about to uh, a couple hours I'm ago? Sorry? I was just reading a few hours ago that the, the Houthis down in Yemen either already have or are soon going to declare war on Israel. They've already confirmed that they've been the ones shooting the rockets at them. Right. And they just did it again. They just did it again in the last day or two. The Israelis shot down a couple drones. It seems like you know that navy. That navy destroyer. One of our destroyers uh, shot down a, a bunch of missiles and drones. What two weeks ago now? Uh, all right. I mean, so the idea is that Hamas's idea is that we will pull that into one final struggle. One, we are just going to have it out. Is that it? You know, is this their way of ensuring that they are the prime resistance, the prime liberation, the prime political movement for the people of Gaza? Do they think that this gives them an advantage over the PA, over Fatah, and that they will then have ownership or the admiration or the allegiance of all the Palestinian people because they're the ones who stood up to Israel? I mean, maybe. But does any They're of that be dead. Do, exactly does <laughs> any of that to any of us make any sense though in terms of what you knew you would be pulling down on your head here uh, and yeah I mean so and I think this is one of the the real problems we have when we discuss this uh, in 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 our culture in right because everything in our culture everything in our society everything in our media landscape and our politics has to be a versus b has to be binary has to be blue versus red has to be good versus evil. So if you criticize Israel for massive human rights violations, right, for, for this, 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 this ethnic cleansing, these massacres, then you must, by the way our media political landscape operates, you must then be on the side of Hamas, right? There's, there's no ability to have any nuance here. You know, it has to be A versus B. And so if you say that Israel, is, Israel should be, uh, uh, you know, he should uh, be held responsible for its actions, that the United States should not be supporting Israel, which, which we should mention 
uh, very cl- we should say very clearly that without the U.S. support, none of this would be possible. Without U.S. support, Israel could not be doing what it's doing right now. And so we are just not complicit with it as a nation. We are a direct participant in that sense. But, you know, either the idea that we could also say that, yeah, Hamas should be held responsible too. You know, just because I don't support Benjamin Netanyahu's government doesn't mean I support, uh, you know, Hamas. And it's we waste so much time in these conversations because that's the that's the setup, that's the way our, our again our political media landscape o- operates, and it's really difficult. Uh, but you know your question about why did they do it is a really good one. I mean it's a really good one, and I think the 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 moral horror of what they did on October seventh is clear, and I think also possibly the strategic error. Uh, you know, uh, but. You know, we also have to be very careful that we don't we don't automatically assume that the people we're talking about are rational actors. No, no they're, they're, they're clearly got a screw loose because I can't imagine like ever having an inclination to, to you know, kidnap and, and, and kill innocent civilians just to prove a point. Um, I think, though, I, I, anyway, that's a good point you bring up, because the argument for Hamas doing those kidnaps kidnappings is that they would use that to exchange to try and do a prisoner exchange with Israel because Israel holds at before this they held about 5,000 uh, Palestinian prisoners they've taken about 1,500 more plus 4,000 Gazans who were outside of Gaza on work per- permits are being detained so about 10,000 prisoners now basically and so the idea was that but you know again how did the Israelis deal with these things how have they dealt with them in the past you had that one example where they traded a thousand Palestinian prisoners for one Israeli soldier it was that is that going to be replicated ever again you know, I mean, so even that argument that what they were doing was some type of what was to try and be able to do a prisoner swap really falls apart, I feel like, when you look at, well, what was the likelihood of Israel responding in a manner that would have allowed that stratagem to be successful? What was more likely? What was very, li- you know, what was very likely was that Israel was going to respond as they have. You know, so a lot of this just falls apart when you start walking through, it's pulling you know, when you start get, yeah, you start getting the second, third order effects of these things. It, it doesn't, it doesn't hold, you know, it doesn't, doesn't carry any weight or hold water anymore. I'm remember, I'm reminded of the period of time between 2018 and 2019 at the Gaza border, those Gaza border protests, what they called the uh, great march of return. And not a lot of people talk about this and, and, and it's, and it's a very interesting like development there. Uh, and it's every Friday, a bunch of people in the Gaza Strip would go march on the Gaza Israeli border. Uh, and they did this from the end of March through basically the end of December 2019. So it's quite a long time, you know, that they were that they were running this. And over that period of time, these were all peaceful protests. Like you might see a couple of p- folks like throwing a couple rocks here and there. But generally speaking, right, nobody was armed. You know, nobody's shooting rockets. Hamas wasn't throwing any rockets across the border. And and about 223 Palestinians were killed by Israeli forces during that time. You know, just picking them off, you know, because they're easy, you know, and they were approaching the border and they were somehow a threat. We're talking about, you know, everyone, women, children, you know. Oh, they, 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 they shot, males, people, they shot, they shot people in wheelchairs. Yeah. Um, yeah. They shot about 10,000 people, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. Right. And, Killed and, 200 um, and so I think you know, about like, that, and, and I think about Hamas's decision to to go do the the October seventh, like this heinous thing. And I'm thinking to myself, if you were so resolute to die, why not do this again, but in in a in a bigger in a bigger way? Well, because I, I think what you saw there was with the Great March of Return, that was the the, the Gazans attempting to do nonviolence. What you always heard, you know, Tom Friedman, for mm-hmm. you know the New York Times columnist, was famous for saying this: Why don't the God, why don't the Palestinians do like Gandhi, do like Martin Luther King, mm-hmm. and do a giant Sittings. march? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And they did. They tried that. And, and they died. It, yeah, exactly. And, and how many of the Hamas fighters that went over the fence, you know, that went across the fence line on October 7th had family members that were shot? Because it wasn't like, you know, the wounds were, you know, they missed. They were trying to kill and they missed. No, most of the wounds were were 
accurate uh, Israeli marksmen and snipers shooting people in the leg uh, to permanently maim them. Uh, and this is something you see all throughout the West Bank and East Jerusalem as well. The Israeli military and Israeli border police will use a, uh, a, 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 a 22 caliber round mm -hmm. that they'll put in their, their M16s and their M4s that fires at a, it's a subsonic round, if I remember correctly. And these guys are trained to shoot at certain points in the leg that will not kill, won't hit an artery, that will permanently maim the person for life. Uh, so a lot of times in, in below the knee, around the ankle area, uh, right? I mean, so it, it, this is something that is regularly done to punish the people, to, to provide a warning to them, to be punitive, right? So if you go to the West Bank, you will meet people who are walking with a limp because they were shot deliberately in the leg with a special round by a specially trained soldier or border policeman who meant to do that. And so you saw that as well. So how many of these Hamas fighters that went into these kibbutzes and villages and towns, not only were going into the villages and towns that their grandparents and great grandparents have been expelled from, you know, uh, uh, 55 years ago or 75 years ago, depending upon which expulsion you're talking about, but the uh, how many of them also had seen the Great March of Return, had family who had taken part, friends who had taken part, and seen the response to that. The other thing, too, is that if you can imagine, possibly, there was this discussion among the leadership in Gaza how to go forward. And so the idea was, we are going to try this. We are going to do this nonviolent action. We are, this is going to be our, our chance to nonviolently resist the occupation, and the world will see it, and they will respond. And the Israelis slaughtered hundreds of them. They maimed thousands of them in, you know, just just cold blood. Uh, you know, there's no mistaking about any of this. Uh, and the world's response was nothing, absolutely nothing. And so those who were proposing this on the Gazan side were sidelined. They, they were shut down. They, they, we tried your thing. It didn't work. We told you it was going to work. The only thing we can do is fight. And so I got to believe a lot of people, too, lost just a lot of hope. And that desperation got bigger. And of course, if we're talking about desperation leads to more extreme forms of action, right? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, you see that you can't talk about all this. This is the context that the Secretary General of the United Nations was talking about, for which, you know, he was uh, so uh, shamefully uh, uh, abused and pilloried. And, and you know, his, his resignation was demanded by uh, you know, not just the Israelis, but, you know, American members of Congress as well, you know, for, for daring to say the word context or that this didn't happen in a vacuum, you know. But if you don't understand all that, you can't, I think, get to the point of why did they launch these attacks? Why did they do what they did on October 7th? You know, and that's not excusing it. It's not condoning it, but it's trying to understand it because a lot of us are perplexed by it. You know, and so was what happened in 2018, 2019 with the great March of Return, was that the last breath of hope that they had? And once that occurred, there was no turning back, that the October 7th attacks were inevitable, that there was going to be some grand, uh, uh, what, what, what do they say in Animal House? This calls for a, a grand futile gesture, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, like, but, you know, not to be glib about it, but is that, is that what they were dealing with here? We have nothing left. And we are, you know, Jonathan Cook uh, said this very well. This is the plight, this is the dilemma of the Palestinians. To either die slowly without being noticed or to fight back and be called terrorists. And that's their dilemma. And I, I think the world is witnessing the consequences of the failure of its actions in allowing it to get to this point where both the October 7th attacks were inevitable and, of course, then the Israeli response was was entirely predictable. Sure. I, I, sure. I just think I think they could have avoided killing the civilians. I think they could have legitimately hit the military targets. I think they if they wanted to take prisoners, they could have. I just don't think it. it you know, again, right. we're talking about people that, that probably aren't in the right mental framework, but... Well, the bloodlust, and it's war. It's bloodlust, blood yeah, And it gets exactly going, you know, yeah. and, and that killing, uh, it, it's a life of its own. This is a force of its own. This is a, you know, you go to war. I made this, I probably said this to you guys before, but you go to war, in my case, and, and other guys I know, and you think that you're going to be your own agent, that you will act morally, 
uh, and it's the greatest folly. It's the stupidest thing you could ever think because the reality is is that the war is going to make you an agent of its immorality. And that's what occurred here. And it wasn't like these young Hamas fighters were for the first time being exper- going into war. Their whole lives were enmeshed in war, whether it was direct kinetic air assaults and ground assaults from the Israeli army, or it was the blockade itself and everything that comes from that, because that's a form of warfare. You know, so you, you do, I mean, the, the excuses that you see why it got, it's excuses is that, well, we went, we were going to only fight the military, we were only going to take soldiers as prisoners, and then it got out of hand. And, uh, you know, I mean, the excuses are is that the uh, once Hamas, the Hamas commandos went through the fence line, all these other uh, Gazans went through as well. And it became a, a killing spree and on and on. And it wasn't the actual Hamas soldiers that did these atrocities. It was, you know, unorganized groups and all these other excuses that don't make any difference. You know, I mean, w- what we saw was was. Uh, it was was absolutely soul repulsive. Uh, but, you know, what we run into, though, is run into a risk of, of creating, trying to create hierarchies here of who did worse. You know, and I think that's why some of the stories that have, you know, either been disproved or just never verified about the beheaded babies and the mass rape of women, those kind of things were done to show that Hamas is worse. So even as uh, we see this in the conversation now, even as Israel has killed 3,500 children, 440 children killed and wounded every day with American supply bombs dropped from American supplied aircraft subsidized by the American taxpayers, of course, right? But even as that's occurring, there is the argument, well, at least they didn't cut off the baby's heads, right? So we get into this, this again, because everything has to be A versus B, it has to be binary, and, and it, right? It causes such a problem in our society because we can't have a conversation that has any context or nuance, and you have to have a side, and you can't just say, and I've never seen anything like this in my life, you know? I mean, this idea that somehow you are immoral for calling for uh, the cessation of the killing of innocent people, and somehow morality is on the side of those who are killing the innocents. Uh, in, in both cases, both the attacks on October 7th. You know, and if they had, if Hamas had just contained their attacks to uh, uh, Israeli military targets, I, I would not be criticizing them one way or in any way. I mean, they have a right to do that, to resist. But certainly what they did on October 7th was, was just, you know, mass, mass atrocity, mass war crime. Well, so military perspective here, how and and this is the question that we've been asking ourselves every single you know uh time we come on the show since this started is like how does this even happen it it clearly seems like a huge failure on the part of the israeli uh, military and intelligence systems um almost bordering to a uh to, to more nefarious like they let it happen kind of theories right and so uh, we, we we went through at length, and I wonder if you've done any research on this yourself. Uh, just talking specifically about the the, the paragliders, uh, because th- this is just the most ridiculous part of the entire. You know, this is the air part of the air, land, and sea assault that that happened, and it's just like Henry and I talked about this for like fifteen minutes on, on one of the episodes that we did, and we we're like, all right, either you have you have to go and train on how to use this. It's not just like a device that you just get into and it just works, right? You have to know how to fly these things. So where are you learning how to fly it? So either you have to export a bunch of Hamas people, get them out, have them trained and bring them back in with all that equipment, right? Or they're training in broad daylight here. And just very recently, Henry, I don't know if you saw these, but uh, Hamas was putting out videos like, hey, look, th- these were the training videos. We were doing it right here in our backyard. How do you not notice that? Like, I, I just... I, right. Yeah. Where do you where did they think they're going to fly these things to? You know, um, I thought I thought Israel controlled the airspace of Gaza as well. Right. Wouldn't that be like a direct like, no, you cannot do that. You know, they they they, they do. They control. I mean, there's the uh, Gaza fishing boats have to have to go where the Israeli Navy tells them to go to or they get sunk. You know, and, and anything that flies, you would imagine they would shoot down. You'd imagine that they have this buffer zone around the fence line of 300 meters. You would imagine that any drone that 
got near the fence line. You know, and then this is, I think, why a lot of us scoff at the idea about the Israelis are hitting these targets surgically and that they knew there was a command right here and there's a command control center here because you didn't even see them do planning and preparing and training for two years maybe for this assault. Again, where do you think they're going to fly these paragliders to? You know, and they've got these big green canopies on them. It wasn't like these things weren't observable. Right, they're not uh, stealth you know, and at all. there's a lot of, <laughs> yeah. what's that? They're not stealth whatsoever. No, there, there's, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for it. I, I think it, it, it's, it's. I, I come back to what's the, um, you know, the definition of luck is uh, preparation and timing. And I, I think that Hamas and Islamic Jihad and, and, and the other groups prepared and they prepared and they prepared and their timing was exquisite. Uh, they were, if you look at what the Israelis were, were prioritizing, Gaza was not at the top of their priority list. They were prioritizing the West Bank. They were prioritizing uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. They were, they've been dropping bombs in Syria a, a couple of times a week for years now. Uh, of course, they are obsessed with Iran. And so you look at it, and, and, and if you look at this in some commentators, the Mossad, particularly in the last, uh, last part of the last year, has gotten very much involved in Ukraine. And so you look at that and you say, okay, maybe Gaza was priority five or six for the Mossad and for Unit 8200. And Unit 8200 is their, their version of the NSA, basically, and Shin Bet, which is their internal security services, right? So maybe maybe they were just priority five or six. And so, you know, at the end of the meeting, they only get a couple minutes of attention. And the boss doesn't have time to review your PowerPoint slides about Gaza, you know? And then there are other things, too. Uh, obviously, again, the West Bank was a huge priority with the settlers there. And we do know that the Israelis moved... Uh, you know, I haven't seen good numbers on. It. I've seen two battalions, a full brigade, whatever it is. But that a good chunk of the Israeli army that was supposed to be guarding Gaza uh, had been moved up to the West Bank to protect the settlers because if people have been following what's happening in the West Bank. The settlers have been getting more and more aggressive every year. This past year, uh, more aggressive than last. Last year was record number of of Palestinians killed in the West Bank. It was on pace this year to be a, to beat that record. Now it has already beat that record, of course, because more than 100 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank in the last few weeks. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, so that was there. And so you just had a thinner grouping of forces there, less people to do the work. Um, and anytime you have something like that, when you move forces, you have a very real danger of miscommunication. So you could have one commander who is ba who who on October seventh could have been like, wait, I'm responsible for that. I thought they were responsible for that. You mean so you have that type of miscommunication which occurs in the you know in the proverbial fog of war. Uh, you mean so all these things I mean all come together to show a timing. And then there's other things as well uh, as as has been discussed quite a bit. Uh, Netanyahu was very keen on this plan to buy off Hamas. That the Qataris were going to bring in money, we're going to give work permits, we're going to we're going to bribe them to be good, and that was the boss's plan. So who's going to go in and tell the boss that his plan isn't working? You know, particularly someone like Netanyahu, you can imagine how you'd be received. I mean, so like all these things come together possibly to present the perfect time for the uh, for Hamas to launch these attacks. Uh, certainly, the build up to it, right? The violence in the West Bank, the continued desecration of of mosques and churches by settlers, the desecration of the Al Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. All these things continue and build so that it's a swell, it's a it's a wave, or what they call it, they call it the Aqsa Flood or the Aqsa Storm was the name for their operation, right? You get that idea of that this is all culminating, and it culminated at the best time possible because the Israelis seem not to have prioritized Gaza. They have pulled troops away. They had another plan that they thought was working in Gaza. You know, all these different factors. There's also been some criticism that maybe the Israelis got too into the automation of their defenses, that too much into the artificial intelligence because they have, if people have seen the videos, one of the first things the, the uh, Hamas does is they fly their drones and they drop grenades or bombs onto these automated machine gun towers, right? I mean, so once, if you, if you understand how those systems are connected, 
you know, are you then able to find kind of the key nodes and blind the Israelis to what you're doing? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I, it's just, uh, it is shocking, though. It definitely leads to the conspiracy theories, as you were alluding to, that this was, you know, if there's any truth to that, I would imagine it was simply that it would simply be that they were aware something was going to happen, but they thought it was going to be the usual. They thought it was going to be a bunch. They're going to shoot a bunch of rockets at us. They're going to try and get some of their guys over the fence. You know, we might lose a couple people, but no big deal. And then if you want to go like one more step and make it nefarious, then it would be, well, this would then give us our causes belly, right? This would give us our reason to launch the cleansing of Gaza we wanted. You know, I, I don't really think any of that is is the case you've demonstrated more than enough uh probable and plausible you know uh issues you know that 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 would have been not conspiracy driven or or even nefarious in in any way just you know asleep at the wheel really that's all yeah yeah you know and and it's um you know but you do you look at and you say how did they get how did they get to that fence line because they're supposed to shoot anything that comes within 300 meters of the fence line right and and uh, there was a, a I read an article and they quoted some paragliding expert who said he wanted to be unnamed because he didn't want to bring the sport into like the political sphere. So you know, take that with a grain of salt. But he was saying that like the construction of these things are such that like any handgun can take them down with a single right. shot. You know, it's just like right. just take right. any yeah. shot at them. You know, and and it's like you'll thwart them. Uh, yeah, let alone an automated. 50 caliber machine gun right yeah. <laughs> so it's just it's it's well i mean that's the thing too you, you hear in these reports that the israeli army didn't respond for up to 10 hours yeah. right i mean so it wasn't like you know and some of that that's what was what was i think so surprising to me was seeing some of the initial videos of hamas taking some of the armored vehicles the tanks along the fence line like basically where they were where they were asleep basically but they you know, uh, and then, of course, and now a big thing for people who want to apologize about October 7th is that the Israelis killed a lot of their own a lot of their own people, which undoubtedly is true. That's what happens. You know, uh, it, it's 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 it, that's what happens. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. But, you know, certainly trying to dress up what occurred on October 7th as something noble, uh, I, I think, is very hard to do. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, this brings us back to Gaza, though. So, I mean, if they couldn't spot this, how would they be able to know? Like, how would they have the intelligence where these Hamas commanders are in Gaza? Uh, you, you would I, think, I know, right? <laughs> it's, it's because, I mean, you have to think that the places that they bombed already are, are places in Gaza where they already had some level of intelligence that, you know, maybe Hamas is operating out of there. Everything now... You have to think is just like, all right, we're just going to look for whatever target seems somewhat suspicious and bombs away. Right. I mean, and, and we, we, you, we seem to understand that the Israeli human intelligence capability was very poor, uh, you know, in terms of having spies in Gaza was very poor. Uh, you know, I can't imagine it's gotten better in the last four weeks. Uh, you've had communication blackouts uh, where it'd be very difficult for people to communicate. Uh, it, it, and, and the point being is like that. What does that do for your signals intelligence? Uh, so is it possible if they are able to locate some of these commanders based upon, you know, uh, signals, intercepts, hearing radios, picking up cell phones, whatever. But the Hamas and Islamic Jihad and these other groups are very disciplined. The idea that you, uh, you, you're you going to find this command. They said that the, the person they killed and his name escapes me was the commander of the October 7th attacks. You're going to you're going to tell me that they got lucky or, or that after four weeks or three and a half weeks, he broke radio discipline, if you will. And that's how they found him. You know, I mean, so yeah, maybe, maybe they did get lucky. Maybe they did, uh, you know, get some type of uh, tip from uh, human intelligence or whatever. Or they, I, I don't know. Uh, but the idea that they could miss the entire attack, as well as what you said, uh, Henry, that you, they would have already attacked all their targets that they knew of. Um you know, yeah, I think a lot of us scoff at the idea that these attacks really have any value to them other than just destruction and punishment. And and, and what I said before, just just uh, methodically collapsing all the buildings so that you're sealing off 
all the tunnels. That's that's the only thing I can come to where I could say, hey, look, there's a here's a here's a trace of or a sim uh, some type of of semblance of uh, you know I'm trying to find the right word to describe this as strategic it's also strategy yeah, yeah exactly yeah. some some sense of purpose in what they're doing you know uh, I don't want to say sanity right but at least you can say okay this is the plan we're going to collapse all these buildings we're going to seal them off because they can't get out of the tunnels they're just going to build them again like 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 it, it, Israeli officials have been on record saying like hey you drop a tunnel today. Two years later, that tunnel's back up, right? Right, exactly, so, exactly. Like, they're just going to make it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no... Uh, uh, Seymour Hirsch had a good piece on this this week talking about it. He talked about the scale of the tunnels, and he went into a little bit about what I was just talking about, about in terms of the purpose of collapse in these buildings, you know, which, uh, you know, but he also talked about how big of an effort it was. And that he was he was saying that uh, the amount of dirt that would be required would fill 140,000 dumpsters. Oh my God. Right. You know, that basically enough dirt to build the great pyramid. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I mean, that's how much we're talking about here. So they were able to do all that, uh, you know, and how long they can survive in them. I don't know. I mean, you'd imagine that if they were expecting this response, they're expecting the Israel to come in with ground forces. They would be prepared, be prepared to be in those tunnels for six months, a year. I don't know. I mean, but certainly they've had a long enough time to prepare. So let's say that the Israelis are able to, you know, they're able to accomplish their goal of maybe demilitarizing Hamas. And, you know, Occupation that sounds extremely unrealistic, like the situation that they had between 67 and 2005. Um, I don't see them having an appetite to, to occupy Palestinians in Gaza. But you see this plan, and I don't know how realistic this is, that a boss will come in and essentially, and, and I think the word was from a Palestinian uh, or a former Palestinian minister, that he would be essentially rolling in in, a, in an IDF tank. And... There's there seems to be this plan where he would be, I guess, the custodian of the, you know, the the prison camp. But yeah, that, that's it, yeah. In order to do that, though, wouldn't they need because the Palestinian Authority authority, they can't even completely control the territory that they have. Like they still can't totally control like cities like Janine and in Nablus in the West Bank. If they're if they're the custodians of this prison, like what do they do? Do they go into this like the this kind of a debathification type program where they have to fire you know the forty thousand people who are already civil servants in Gaza? Like what happens to those people? Like do they do they? I mean, do they form Hamas too? Like are they disgruntled people, unemployed people on the streets? Like it just seems every single solution that is brought out seems so unrealistic and unfathomable, at least in a political sense, that you have to think that the only thing that would be viable, and I hate to say it, is their potential plan to you know push these people into the Sinai. Because I saw another plan where you know they were thinking about maybe cobbling together some other type of alternative administration, you know, with you know former PA security, you know chiefs who would take the reign in Gaza after Hamas but you know that doesn't seem realistic either I know the guy that they were talking about currently lives in Abu Dhabi he's been there for the past 10 years and he had been convicted in a in a PA court for corruption so it sounds like a pipe dream as well um so I just it's like where where do you go it just it just seems so reckless and it can go in so many different directions like the it, a political solution just seems so far away um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not even, it's not even being considered, you know, it's not even, we, we can talk about it. We can, we can jump up and down and say, it's the only solution. It's the only way, uh, but there it's, it's, it's not even anything that, that the Israelis are going to contemplate and that the Americans are going to force them to contemplate, uh, even though we all know that that is the only way out of this, 
uh, yeah, I'm reminded, you're right, uh, uh, you talked about yeah, bringing this guy in from uh, Abu Dhabi or, or wherever. I remember, if you guys recall back in early 2010, when Stan McChrystal launches his big surge uh, campaign in Afghanistan, and you have the Operation Mosharak uh, in Helmand Province, and it, the, this, the, the village is uh, Marja. If people remember that name, and you know they 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 we clear, hold, build is is the mantra, and we're going to bring in the government in a box, and we're going to bring in these. And, and who did we bring in? We brought in some Afghan who've been living in Germany for the last thirty years. You know, I mean, and how well did that go? You know, I mean, like the 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 idea too then of, of a boss coming in. So you have these different plans, right? One is to bring in uh, kind of a transitional international governance structure. So basically, you're saying the the problem we're we're going to solve this problem by reintroducing colonialism. You know, we're going to bring it right. I mean, like that. New type governors, of thing. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I mean, exactly. Provi uh, you know, a provisional authority. Uh, you know, we're going to give them pith, hel pith helmets and they're going to wear those shorts. They're just going to be like, you know, uh, uh, British uh, colonial administrators in Africa, you know, or something like that. You know, I mean, the, the, the other option is, yeah, bring in a boss, uh, you know, or other Palestinians. And, and, you know, when I was in Palestine in 2017, I spent three weeks in the West Bank and I heard when they were kind of in a safe spot, you know, where they might not be overheard or they trusted everyone around them. Uh, the Palestinians badmouthed the PA, the Palestinian Authority, much more than they badmouthed the Israeli government. They, they, of course, saw the Israelis as occupiers, but to them, the PA was worse because they were collaborators. So is Abbas going to take that role on? It, it's, it's, it falls into the, the, the long running idea of the Israeli government of to divide the Palestinians. And this is in the history of, of, the, of, of, of uh, you know, particularly uh, uh, post-Oslo, but also all through the 80s, this idea we're going to split the Palestinians, we're going to favor some fact factions against other and create a Palestinian civil war, if you will, that will never, that will make sure that they never have their act together and there never will be a united, a cohesive political movement that can ensure the establishment of a Palestinian state. You know what I mean? So that it too is that if you bring in Abbas or someone like him to rule in Gaza, would that cause such dissension, not just in Gaza, but then also through the West Bank and East Jerusalem, because you have this collaborator now ruling over or administering, uh, you know, the, the, the fiat of the Israeli military, uh, would that, you know, I mean, is that what they're thinking is, you know? Uh, I, so, but you, you do get to that point where if you're being objective about this and you're saying, if I was Israelis, what would I do, right? I mean, if I, it, it comes down to this idea of subjugation uh, and uh, eradication. And that's how you conduct uh, a successful colonization, basically. And that's what you're talking about here. So it is the, the, the idea that there's some type of way out of this that doesn't involve that that is basically a military solution is, is you know, is ludicrous. Uh, you know, everything you go through in sense of like, what could they, could they do this? Could they do that? It doesn't get to that fundamental underlying problem of occupation and of resistance to occupation. And that Hamas, again, is, is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. And so you're just chasing the symptoms without getting the problem. But, you know, for the Israeli government, particularly this government, you know, such, a, such a, 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 an approach like that is just simply anathema. You know, uh, it's just simply anathema. And one of the issues you have here, uh, I think, is that there is no exit for either of them. Right. There is no exit for the Israelis. They always have nowhere to go. Look, when the British had their mandate in Palestine and they had their people being killed by Israeli terrorists, by Palestinian terrorists, however you want to call them, you know, you know, bombings and everything else, assassinations, uh, you know, gunfights, uh, the, the, the British could leave. The British could also leave Ireland. Right. They could leave Northern Ireland. Uh, the British could leave uh, the colonies, right? Yeah, they could leave India. There's, there was an exit, right? The U.S. could leave Vietnam. We could leave Iraq. We could leave. The Israelis can't leave. So that's a pressure, I think, as we look at this, we have to really understand is that Israeli perspective, what is possible for them, you know, in terms of the politics, uh, you know, as well as the pressures that come from, uh, you know, their own their own people. So they re realistically couldn't just let go of, of, of Gaza. They couldn't just let go of the West Bank and say, all right, my bad. 
do whatever you want because the blowback would be real for them. Well, Danny, let me let me jump in real quick. They would both say that they can leave. So the Israelis would say, well, the Arabs can go back to Jordan. Yeah, I guess you're right. right. Exactly. And yeah. then the Israeli, then the Pal- Palestinians would say, well, the the Jews can go back to Europe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the that's. Uh, um, <clears throat> and of course, sorry to interrupt you, Danny. No, no, no. You're, but you're right. You're right. They could leave technically. How about everybody leaves and we just leave it completely empty, right? Like nobody's allowed to live there anymore. Yeah, just nobody. Well, now, but now we're getting into like two state, one state. You know, the two state solution seems impossible because of the settler issue. And then just the one state, let's just say if they, in some, if there is some visionary Israeli leader who grants all these, uh, all the Arabs Israeli citizenship, well, then they would lose their majority. Um, and I think that the perk of living in a Jewish state would be gone. Like you wouldn't have, you, you know, you wouldn't have preferred citizenship. So sure. you probably would see Israelis just leave or immigrate out of it. If there, if there was no point to having a Jewish state in the first place, Maybe. if they gave all the, the I, yeah, it's just, but it seems like both, this is existential for both. So it, it's just so hard to look at the future and see anything, um, Anything that looks like peace, which is just, which is just tragic. Like it's, um, you know, it's like it's just this conflict has been going on since I was a kid, obviously, but w- way before it. And it's just there's no, like, we were talking about this a couple of months ago when we were talking about a lot of the Israeli, you know, the the you know the Israeli Cold Civil War mm-hmm. between kind of like the old labor party types, the you know the altruistic. Uh, um, ancestors of the original Zionist um, Ashkenazi versus, you know, kind of like the new makeup of the Israeli regime, which includes those really right wing parties like uh, Itamar Ben Gavir and, you know, the party Jewish power, you know, he's out of the picture right now, but, you know, um, he, he, he represents this, right wing turn that the country's been on since the assassination of Itzhak Rabin. And it just, it's, there just seems like there's no going back. And honestly, it just makes it, Zionism has turned into a nightmare because it was supposed to be a place that was going to be the safe haven for Jews, you know, finally a state to, to, to stand up for the Jews. And now Israel is, a, is the most unsafe place in the world for Jews um, without exception. And then you have to look at how Jews are being treated in the rest of the world because of this. Look at what recently happened in Dagestan in Russia. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some people who just came back and literally, I don't even think these people were Jewish. A lot of Russian citizens will go to Israel for help for, for like cancer treatment. And they came back to a, what seemed like a lynch mob to greet them at the airport. Yeah, well, I so saw the one Israel's video was that the guy was like an Uzbek. He's like, I'm Uzbek. Like, I don't speak Uzbek because I was born elsewhere, but like, I'm not even, I'm not even part of this. It's like, he held his passport and stuff like that. It was just fucking terrible. All on suspicion. Just the suspicion and coming from Israel. It's, it was disgusting. Disgusting. And it's only going to get worse. Mm-hmm. That, that's only going to get worse. I mean, the, the, that type of, of anti-Semitism the, the, and, and the Islamophobia as well right. will only get worse. It, and it serves the purposes of those who, you know, uh, purposes are best served by hate and division and uh, that type of vile rhetoric. And the violence is only, I mean, like the, the idea that uh, the more people you kill, somehow there's going to be calmer spirits and uh, more uh, quiet, you know, uh, quiet and calm conversations and everything mm-hmm. else. It's just not, we, we know that's not the case. The more people you kill, the more people are going to get upset, ex- you know, uh, excited uh, and inspired and go back to what we talked about with Erdogan, you know, uh, this weekend. And, and he had another speech earlier, la- uh, later in the week, last week, uh, you know, basically these calls for call to arms and um yeah this is very concerning where this can go um very concerning you know so i mean i think on november 3rd when nasrallo speaks i don't i think it's going to be a lot of browbeating but it's really hard for me to imagine 
that Hezbollah truly enters this war. Um, it's, it's, it's even more hard to imagine that any other major, you know, predominantly Muslim state, you know, most notably Turkey or, or, um, or, or really any other Arab or Muslim state in the Middle East gets involved as well. Um, but there's always that risk. What do you think this, like, what do you think the chances of this becoming a larger regional war I think we have to remember that there are those, there are hardliners in every one of these countries that want to see a war, right? I mean, if you if watched Lindsey Graham on CNN the other day, you know, oh, certainly. Well, there's never a war he didn't want. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and but, but um, I mean, so you have, uh, look, at, on the American side, um, <clears throat> the whole project for a new American century, right? Going back to the 90s, one of their goals was to remake the Middle East. And they have tried over and over again to do that. First with the Iraq War, right? That was one of the purposes of the Iraq War was to remake the Middle East. When I got to Baghdad in April of, uh, it was April or May of 04, and I was with the Coalition Provisional Authority before it became the U.S. Embassy, and we had people there who were saying things, and this is this is a year and a couple months into the war, and things were not going well. The first Battle of Fallujah had already taken place. And, you know, people saying things like, well, you know, we'll get it. Well, we're, we're going to get this straightened out, you know, but then we got to decide, do we go right or do we go left? Meaning, do we go to Iran or do we go to Syria next? You know, and then certainly if you look at, say, the Syrian civil war and the thing I point to all the time is that in either 2015 or 2016, uh, Michael Vickers, who is the head of special operations and low intensity conflict for the Department of Defense, uh, writes this op ed in The Washington Post. And he says very clearly the Syrian civil war was our best chance to weaken Iran, right? I mean, so you have the top administration officials saying the Syrian civil war wasn't about Syria, it's about Iran. I mean, so you've seen where you have people in power in the U.S. who have engaged in wars to try and fulfill this idea of remaking the Middle East. It's so much based upon this obsession with Iran that goes back to 79. And I'm just focusing right on the Americans. We know that there are people in Tehran who feel this way, right? Who want it? We know that there are there are those in in Riyadh who think that possibly such a war would leave Saudi Arabia in the best position possible of everybody, right? If we can get all these other folks to kill each other, I mean, the the, the madness here, the the, the crackpot realists, as C. Wright Mills used to call them, are still alive and well. We have Americans in Washington D.C. who think that, well, one of the things you can look at is, you know, recently, what, two months ago, uh, Azerbaijan ethnically cleanses Nargana Karabakh, right? They, 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 they drive 150,000 Armenians out of their ancestral homeland. I mean, long simmering, long, long simmering thing. But, you know, this ethnic cleansing happens. And what's the U.S. response? It's almost nothing. It's nothing. And why is that? Because we have people in power who think that the most important thing about Azerbaijan is not that it's run by a cruel uh, f- a dictator, not that it just committed these mass human atrocities, you know, crimes against humanity, but that we could use them as another front in a war against Iran, right? I mean, that's the way they think about these things. We have Americans who are right now thinking along the lines of that. If we go to war with Iran, we're going we're gonna to align with the Taliban and get the Taliban to open a northern front against Iran. This is how people think. People who make a lot of money, who live in very nice houses, very well-funded, uh, work for very well-funded think tanks, sit around in conference rooms and think about these types of things. And those people then go into the White House. They go into the Pentagon. They go into the State Department. They go to the CIA or NSC, right? I mean, so you have these people here in the U.S. thinking that way. And we're not, we are no different than other people. And so there are people in, in Turkey, in, in, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Lebanon, in Egypt, who view it in this crackpot way as if they're playing a real life game of risk or something like that. And so I think, you know, I, I wouldn't know how much if you, if you gave me, if I had to bet a dollar, how much of that dollar I would bet on war, uh, a regional war. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure. I do know that it is set up and constructed in such a way that once it starts, it gives these hardliners all kinds of opportunities to pursue their own dreams, 
right? And certainly, this is where you get into the danger of entangling alliances, right? So that Hezbollah comes into the war while well, they're allied with Syria, who's allied with Iran. So there you have a, a progression that allows you to carry out war against Iran to get this final showdown that's been brewing since 1979 between the U.S. and Iran. I mean, you have, you have people who, who think this way, you know, and important people, you know, Victoria Newland, her husband. I mean, these folks are, this is how they think, right? And we know this because they've said these things and they've done these things. You know, and again, it, it's not just here. It's, and so the danger is very real. You know, the danger is in, in, in how quickly could it occur? Uh, uh, I, I think most I think most of these countries, you know, including the U.S., are hesitant towards it because uh, the awe of it is so much. But there are plenty of people in power throughout these countries that aren't aren't shocked by it, aren't humbled by it, and would think again and think kind of like I was talking about before about going to war and think you'll be your own moral agent and that you can control. It's the same thing too. They think they can make this uh, their agent, that they can control war. And that is, of course, one of the grandest follies of human history is this idea, right? You end up having all the, we have all these stories, right? So Crashes goes into Parthia, right? And he gets the gold poured down his throat and everything else because he thinks he can use war to solidify his place in Rome, right? And see what happens to him. I mean, like, so you have all these stories that populate our own cultures, our histories, our myths. Uh, and we we have people who shrug those off, who think that they are greater than them, that they are, you know, uh, at a level of uh, surpassing anything that has come before them. And we hear this all the time. And when I used to argue against the Afghan war, uh, you know, I'd be arguing against these retired generals and pundits. And, and their argument would be, well, we just came out of Iraq and we learned the lessons of Iraq and our generals know how to do this now. Right. And so anything you're talking about, about resistance and occupation and the reality of insurgency and et cetera, et cetera, and 35 year old civil war. None of that matters because we've we've learned it all. We know better. We're able to master this now. Any of the mistakes were just that mistakes that we made in Iraq or in Vietnam. And now we can do it better. And this is how these people think. It's very, very, very scary. And then, you know, to your point about other people, other other states, I, I was just looking at a poll, um, a Lebanese survey, where it says that a third of Lebanese Sunnis, um, half of its Shias and 13% of its Christians are in favor of going to war with Israel. Yeah. I mean, so. if, if Erdogan a couple of days ago had, you know, said, hey, that's where you. That's where you go to sign up for war with Israel. How many of those million people would have walked over there and you know signed the sheet? You know, um, it is. It, it's it's very scary and how how things can just proceed on their own accord, right? And, and, and worst yeah. worst case scenario, I mean, Israel's armed with nukes. Everyone knows this. Um, you know, if they're cornered, what other option will they have? They can't take on the entire Middle East by their by themselves, even with, you know, two aircraft carriers or carriers in that, like next to them. Like it's it's what other what choice will they have? Yeah, and the nukes are only so good in the sense that you have uh, you know you, you have the Pakistanis having said I believe that they will give nuclear weapons to Turkey if need be, right? I mean, so now you start going down a very dark path, you know, and pulling in other nations as well. And, um, you know, and then the connections, of course, I heard one commentator saying that, and I have not verified this myself, but after, after the, the U S said it was putting the Eisenhower into the, into the area as well as the, as the Ford, uh, the aircraft carriers, um, a commentator I listened to said that he had, he had seen a report that the Russians said that they were going to put MiG 31s over the Black Sea with, with cruise missiles. And I haven't seen any verification of that, but, but, but you could see how that could be very true and it could be the case okay and these we're threatening each other now you know and it seems that we've had a history where we've had good luck you know cuban missile crisis being uh, the best example at what point do we run out of luck you know um at what point does that occur and i i think that's a very humbling thing and should be giving everybody caution and um 
Yeah, I mean, but there's other things too. I think if anything happens, it'll probably be more of a thing that's unexpected. It will be in the form of retribution. It will be, uh, we, we got to remember that, you know, the 9-11 attacks, the 9-11 hijackers, you know, in their martyrdom videos, uh, and then in Bin Laden and the rest of Al-Qaeda, uh, what would they say was the, the, the rationale for those attacks or the reason for those attacks? What was the, the continued sanctions and bombing of Iraq by the United States? It was the presence of American forces in Saudi Arabia, but it was also U.S. support for Israel. Um, and so the idea that retribution, revenge uh, 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 can come uh, in ways that are not expected or in manners, you know, uh, more akin to October 7th or 9-11, uh, you know, is something, you know, and then the, where we are technology wise uh, in terms of what's able to be fielded by uh not you know non-state actors and that type of thing, but what what you know what what nations are able to field in terms of their ability to to uh, conduct extended range warfare, basically. Uh, yeah, I mean this is we're 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 facing something that uh, we just don't know what the consequences can be, other than that the consequences are, are something that we don't want to have to deal with. And so this idea of, of trying everything possible to, to, to prevent that needs to be a priority. It has to be a priority. I mean, the danger of this going to, to a nuclear conflict, it, it can't be overstated. Uh, not when you have nuclear powers involved. If you're talking about a war between, uh, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're talking about like a war between two non-nuclear states, okay, that's one thing. But you're talking about war powers here that have nuclear weapons. Um, and have doctrines of using them. The only country that has, doesn't have a no first use policy is China. Every other nuclear power in the world has a, does not have a no first use policy. So every other country in the world has a doctrine that allows them to use nuclear weapons without being attacked by nuclear weapons first, with the exception of China. And even that, I'm not even sure where the Chinese are on that. They may be changing that. Man, old oh man. Well... This conversation didn't make me feel any better. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, you, you do though. You, you wish that, or you hope, and or, or this idea that something will come out of this, that somehow there will be a ceasefire, somehow there will be a prisoner exchange, there will be something that will put a wedge in the cycle of violence and this immediate cycle of violence that halts everything we're talking about, whether it's this. Or these organized ma these these mass massacres of, of, of civilians, whether it's it's the danger of escalation, but something that just stops it. And then, of course, the idea being is that you have something that builds trust, and from there you can have some type of political settlement, and you can achieve some degree of of peace, stability, reconciliation. But we've never seen that, and it, the the whole issue with Israel is so emotional, it's so political, it's so cultural, so social, so historical that it's always been treated for the last seven decades by the United Nations as its own special thing. It's none of the other none of the other events of the world how the United Nations and the other uh, uh, other powers have uh, uh, dealt with those things have ever been applied to Israel. So the idea of like a reconciliation process, an idea of a protective force, whatever it is, you never you, we've never been considered in, in for, for, for this for, 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 for this uh, circumstance. And I just don't see that changing because everything that's behind that is so powerful. I just don't see the American Congress all of a sudden dropping its support for Israel, right? I don't see Netanyahu and his right-wing government saying, yes, actually, this is a more sound way to go as opposed to going with what keeps them in power. Uh, you know, so it is. And, and of course, Hamas certainly is not going to surrender. Uh, you know, and so what, if, what we see then is just we're going to continue to see this, uh, this cycle of violence and more extreme violence coming and on and on and on. I mean, I, I, it seems like a, a bridge too far uh, from, you know, the perspective that we sit at here, 925 on uh, November 1st here to, to, to find those diplomatic or, or uh, mutually agreed upon uh, uh, resolutions that that get us to a, a place of mutual trust and respect. My money's on the aliens. Um, I think that's pretty much the only thing that could that can change the game in this kind of way. 
Well, I, I should say, I, I would say if there was one thing that's going to change, it's going to be the 2024 presidential election. Really? really? Uh, what if mm. the Saudis were to come, the Saudis, the Qataris, the, the Emiratis, uh, uh, the Russians especially as well, you know, were to come into the White, would say to the White House, there will be an October surprise. You know, uh, on your election day next year, gas will be seven dollars a gallon in the United States if you don't stop this. Right. Mm -hmm. So that type of pressure. We've already seen the pressure on uh, Joe Biden politically uh, in a sense that uh, his drop in his poll numbers. You know, last week we saw that uh, he had lost 11 points in support from Democrats that the pollsters say is because of, uh, you know, his his support of Israel. Uh, you know, is this enough? Uh, I think it's enough because I think what's occurring here is so inexcusable and, and, and it, is, it is not something that's forgivable that you'll have two, three million progressives not vote for Joe Biden next year. And that's enough, particularly if they're in certain states, to give the election to Trump, right? I mean, is that what but would be- Donald Trump is the reason why, the, like, like a pretty- Big reason why uh, uh, the March of Great Return or whatever in 2018 and 2019 wasn't wasn't investigated and wasn't like condemned in the UN in the first place. He, he'll exacerbate this. This will make it worse. Oh, exactly. It will. But in the sense of like the, the consequences to the Biden reelection campaign of aligning themselves with, you know, Israel's war crimes, which is how progressives will see it. Is that enough to keep them from voting from that? They're not going to vote for Trump, but they're just not going to vote for Biden. Right. Does that is that a, 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 a political uh, consequence that causes the White House to then restrain the Israelis? Because the Israelis will be restrained by us. We have that leverage. They've said so themselves. They can't do this without our support, and not just the military support, but the intelligence support, the logistics support, the media support, the diplomatic support, the political support. They can't do this without us. So is that enough to cause the White House to say, we need, you need to stop because you're hurting the president's reelection chances because we have all these progressives who are not going to vote for Biden in the election. Again, they're not going to vote for Trump, but they just won't vote. They'll just leave that blank or not go to the polling booth, vote booth at maybe all. Maybe they'll vote and third party, party Matt. Third what do you think? Or maybe they will I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping. It's a whole other conversation we can come to. But maybe they would. Maybe they will. I mean, the problem being with that, uh, just to put that hat on for a second, is that uh, not many voters in the U.S. because of the way ballot access works are going to be able to vote for a Cornell West or a Bobby Kennedy because they're not going to be on their ballots because of the ballot access problems. So I don't think that they will have that spoiler effect on Biden that a lot of Democrats or on Trump because I've seen polls that say that Kennedy takes more away from Trump than he does Biden. Right. I, I don't know. But but yeah, so are those two things, those are two examples where you could have something occur, right, that causes the Americans to say to the Israelis, hey, knock it off, scale it back, you know, uh, uh, put a little more concern into what you're doing, you know, however they want to phrase it. I, I think particularly the oil thing is something that, uh, could very well likely happen. You heard it here. Gas is going to be really expensive in a year, according to Matthew Ho. So yeah. stock up now. It was a repeat, a repeat of seventy three. Yeah. Is what we all, what we all want. Exactly, because that's why, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not that hard to envision it. Why they did yeah. it then? Why wouldn't they do it fifty years later? Like it's the, the circumstances are they have to do something to show their people that they're standing up for the Palestinians. They're pissed off at Biden anyway. They don't really like him anyhow. Mm -hmm. Right. They, maybe they think they could get something better with a Trump presidency on and on and on. Yeah, it's I, I think that's definitely we were discussing that as well um, a couple of weeks ago that, you know, this could if if there is a reaction from Muslim states, especially OPEC states, then it would it would be, it, you know, be in the oil. Um, all scary stuff. Well, again, you know, it's. We just wanted wanted to end somewhat peacefully. It just seems so far beyond that now. But um, all right, Matt, th thanks for thanks for taking time to speak with us and giving us so much time. It's been it's been almost two hours, and we could definitely speak with you for another two hours. But we want to be conscious of your time. Um, so we really appreciate it. 
if you can let everyone know to find your work, organizations you're with, um, where, where to find more of you. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, on Twitter, Matthew Piho, P as in Patrick, and then I'm with the Eisenhower Media Network. So you could uh, look us up online, just Google Eisenhower Media Network. All right, Danny, do you have any last thoughts? Keep leaving us those uh, nice reviews, uh, and I'm being a little bit facetious, but it's very interesting to see uh, kind of the, the debate raging right now on the Apple uh, um, uh, reviews uh, for bro history. So keep, keep it coming. I'm interested. We're reading them. I promise we are. <laughs> so let us know how you think. Yeah. Tell us, um, how we're bigots. Mm. <laughs> that seems to be a the theme. All right. Um, peace everyone. Catch you later.